Sound check. Check, check. Come on in. Can you guys do a sound check on your end? Yo. Hello. Was um did it, any of my uh, audio last week was any did it, any of it sound muffled at all? Were you able to understand everything I said? Okay, cool. Is Dana joining us? Josh, do you know if Dana's joining us? I don't think she is. Okay, she's gonna do the recording. Yeah, she's she's usually in bed by eight, if not earlier. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Teresa, sound check. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, and can you do a sound check on your end, please? Unmute it. And... Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Sarah, sound check. Can you hear me okay? You have to unmute yours, Sarah. Yes. I can hear you. Okay, good. We can hear you too. Okay, we are missing a few people. Let's see, Andrea, Andrea, and Yuna. We're going to go ahead and get started at seven oh one. Alexa, stop. Okay. Oh. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Vavatu Sahana Obhunaktu Sahana Obhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Sahaviryam Karavavahai Te just vina vadhi tamas tu. Te just vina vadhi tamas tu. Ma vid visha vahai e. Ma vid visha vahai e. O. Shanti 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 May we be protected and nourished together. May we study with vigor and enthusiasm. May we glow brilliantly together. May there be no bad feelings between one another. Om peace, peace, peace. Yogena chittasya, Yogena chittasya, Padena vacham, Padena vacham, Malam shari rasya cha, Malam shari rasya cha, Vaidya kena, Vaidya kena, Yopakarotam. Yo pakarotam pravaram muninam pravaram muninam patanjalim patanjalim pranjali pranjali rana toes me rana toes me abahu abahu purusha karam 
Purushakaram Shanka Chakrasi Shanka Chakrasi Dharinam Dharinam Sahasra Shirasham Sahasra Shirasham Shvetam Shvetam Pranamami Pranamami Patanjalim Patanjalim Shri Mate Shri Mate Anantaya Anantaya Nagarajaya Nagarajaya Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Namo Namaha O Okay. You you can use the little table or star's chair. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, so you guys have access to the the online lectures. Um, now is the time for me to quickly go over the sutras. We spent a lot of time on the first I don't know ten sutras last week. I would like to go over them again just really quickly. And then um, I'd like to take questions. If you don't, if you don't have questions for me, then um, I'll just keep going. And then secondly, remind me when we're nearing time limit. Okay. So um, let's start off. Do you guys have any questions from what you've learned, read, listened? You guys good online over here? Okay. You guys are good? I guess I can ask a question. What's a question? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned the kids, the neuro, neuro, no, no, no thoughts, no nothing. Is that awareness, right? I'm sorry? This is a state of just pure awareness. Yes. So you notice that you're in that with the thoughts, right? Correct. Correct. So uh, Danielle's question is Naroda about the word Naroda. Um, the question was, uh, what was your question exactly? It was basically if you're aware that you're in it, then you have the thought like about, oh, I'm, I'm in Naroda now. Right. So if you have a thought that I'm in Naroda, then you're not in Naroda. Right. If you have, if you have any thought that includes I, me, my, or mine, you're not there. Like, I'm there. That I means you're still there. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, let's keep going. Good question. Um, did you have that experience? No, but um, I had a similar where, where like either in a meditation or something like I'll be in a, in a deep state and I'll notice I'll be there. Yeah. Or other ceremonies I've been in, I've been in this space and then once I notice I'm there, it brings me there after. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Did you guys hear that over there? You guys hear, able to hear what she said? Okay. Um. We good? I'm sorry. You couldn't hear what she said. I could not hear what she said. Um, she said um, that she's been in meditations or ceremonies where she felt like she was in a deep space, like mental space. I guess meditation. I'm assuming, um, and then she had the, uh, a thought that she was there. If you have the, if you have any thoughts whatsoever then you're not there. Does that make sense? Chitta vritti niroda means absolutely no thoughts. You have been there before the thought happened, no? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. See, sam samadhi, look, the, the, the niroda is not anything that none of us have ever not experienced. We've all had tastes of it. Um, 
but it's fleeting. We're unable, we're not able to sustain it. So this is a, this, these procedures and instructions show you how to sustain these states of being. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's go um, to review real quick. Uh, first chapter on the theory, second chapter on practice, sadhana, practice, vibhuti, extraordinary existence, um, special powers, if you will, and then um, kaivalya, freedom or moksha, freedom, liberation, um, freedom from the prison of our minds, the prison of our own limited perception. <clears throat> the first sutra, Atta Yoga Anushasanam, first one, is uh, now begins the practice or the exposition, not the practice, but the exposition of yoga based on the Vedas, Anushasanam following the Vedas. So um, Patanjali is not um, saying he made this up. If, this, if he would have said this, he made this up, he would have said Atta Yoga Anu Anu Patanjalim. Like uh, Patanjali made this yoga up. You know, it was Anushasanam, uh, consistent with the scriptures. Then the second sutra says, Yoga's Chitta Vritti Niroda. Yoga, the subject, uh, is Chitta Vritti, is the mental activities, all mental activities ceasing, Niroda, to stop, stop all mental activity. Um, absolute, absolutely no movement within the mind. Then the third sutra um, tells you what happens as a result, as a result of stopping your mind. What happens? Tada! Drastu svarupe vasthanam. Then the nature of the self is revealed to the observer. The nature of the observer is revealed to the ob observer. In other words, to know thyself, to know who you truly are at a spiritual level. At a spiritual level. That this is, we need to make sure that we understand this because there are. Like there are parts of us that we, we, we identify with, like this body, this name, this mind. The, the, they are all part of who we are, but it's not our true identity because that which is true doesn't change. Our bodies change, our minds change, our personalities change. You know, brain trauma changes the personality. Even changing your diet will change your personality. You guys realize this. Changing your diet will change your personality. So... Um, the, the idea is that you will know your true self, svarupe, taradrastu svarupe, one's true form, which is actually formless, so we'll get to that later. Um, taradrastu svarupe avasthanam. Then the observer, the seer, drastu, the seer, becomes firmly established in him or herself. True self, not false self, not changing self, but unchanging self. Fourth sutra says, vritti sarupyam itaratra, vritti referring to the, the, the activities of the mind. He says that once the activities of the mind begin again, we identify with the false reality. Yes. Say that again. So in the heart of yoga, from Vesikar, it talks about then the ability to understand the object fully and correctly is apparent. So the object is not really the thing, the subject. Yes, the object is that which you are observing. Right. Yes. And so it can be thyself and anything else? Yes. So he asked, he, he asked um, did you guys hear his question online? Um, <clears throat> so I was asking, um, I'm looking at the third sutra and I have the heart of yoga by Deskachar and he talks about, uh, then the ability to understand the object fully and correctly is apparent. And so I was asking if you are, you know, getting this single point of focus, you know, by correctly applying yoga, if you're under... Ricky said that you understand, you know thyself, right? And then, but uh, Deskachar refers to the object. And so I was wondering if you can also therefore observe the world around you. Good question. In the videos, I talked about Sankhya philosophy. How many guys got, got to that part? 
in the videos where I talked about Sankhya. Sankhya, right? So in Sankhya, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because I talk about this at length in the video. Sankhya philosophy talks about the 24 tattvas or thatness, and then the, uh, those are um, the the the, uh, the 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 evolution of of the universe, literally. So from from um, everything from your senses to your your limbs to your organs to the elements from you know the earth, water, um, uh, fire, uh, air, and ether. These are all objects. So in order to understand yoga properly, Sankhya philosophy should be studied as well. And those are the objects. Those are the objects. The objects are, can be internal and external. So the world around you, yes, you can, you can understand things around you. But yoga, as I said in the video, is an adhyatma. Can anyone tell me what an adhyatma means? What is adhyatma? In the video, I talked about adhyatma. Adhyatma means study of one's atma. Adhyatma. Yoga is an adhyatma. Adhyatma atma means self, soul, soul, the innermost being. It's a study of oneself. So the object of study is me. I am the object and the subject. I am the subject and the object. So it's really not really about studying, because uh, there's so many sciences. Every science you have objects is like, I'm studying the stars, I'm studying botany, I'm studying plants, I'm, or I'm studying animals. The object is outside of you. Yoga, the subject is inside of you. So yes, you can apply your, your power of samadhi onto an external object, but that's not what yoga, that's not the, 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 the whole, this whole yoga is an adhyatma, it's a study of oneself. It's taking that, that lens and turning it inward. So yes, to answer your question, you can study the external world, but that's not yoga. That's applying yoga skills to the external world. Like later on, he talks about, you know, you can know the movements of the stars by studying the moon, Astro astrology, astronomy. You can understand these things. He, he talks about this, but, but ultimately, this practice is a, about looking inward. Answer your question? Yes. And, and ultimately, the object that we're studying is chitta, the chitta. That is the object that we're studying in yoga, really, ultimately, is the chitta. Okay? Okay, so um, that's, um, so our question is uh, uh, the difference between the true self and being true to yourself. Okay. Um, your true self is an object. It's an object. Your, the self is an object. Um, being true to oneself is behavior. Cool. All right, let's move on. Anything else? Good? Online? Okay. Tara drastu svarupe vasthanam. Tara drastu svarupe vasthanam. Then the nature of the self is revealed to the seer. Vritti sarupyam itaratra. Then when the mind begins again, we identify with these activities of the mind. Um, the fifth sutra says, Vritti, vritti af panjataya klishta, aklishta. There are five activities of the mind. There are five activities of the mind that causes pain, klishta, or aklishta, not pain. Those five activities are pramana, vipariyaya, vikalpa, nidra, and smritayaha. Pramana being correct cognition, vipariya means incorrect cognition, um, vikalpa means imagination, nidra means sleep, and smriti means memory. These are the five activities that everyone has on a um, daily basis from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. And then they wake up, they go to sleep. And this, these are the five activities that we constantly go through. Um, seven, se, Sutra 7 says, Pratyaksha Numana Gama Pramana Ni. So here he's talking, he's defining pramana, correct cognition. In correct cognition, there are um, right knowledge, is, is you can have right knowledge three different ways. Right knowledge three different ways. They use the, 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 the example of a fire, 
So you can, you can have a direct experience of fire. You can touch the fire. You can touch the fire, get burned, and go, that's fire. No one's going to convince me otherwise. I touched the fire. Or you can learn that there is fire because someone told you that there's fire. You can hear it from uh, someone else, or you can read it. So this is secondhand knowledge. There's a fire down the street. Okay. I can understand that correctly. And that can cause pain or not cause pain. Right? But it's secondhand knowledge. It's not a direct experience. The third way is through inference. Inference is by seeing smoke on the other neighborhood. You see smoke, you can infer that there's fire. You didn't see it. No one told you, but you're inferring. Which is the most reliable source? Direct perception. And yoga is all about a direct perception. It's not about what someone told you about this or that or the other. It's not hearsay. It is not, you're not inferring. You can infer, but it's, but, but you're still going to, you're probably, there can be doubt, in other words, if you learn from someone else, secondhand knowledge. Yeah? Yeah, with me? Yoga is about having a direct experience. I don't have to, I don't have to have faith in my hand because I know my hand. I have a direct experience with my hand, right? I don't, I, I know Pete over here. I know Pete. No one, if I hadn't met Pete yet, and you guys talk about Pete, I'll have to have to go uh, by your word about Pete, right? You guys can talk a lot of trash about Pete, <laughs> and I might not know Pete, and I, have, I can form a, an opinion about Pete based on your words. But if I really want to know Pete, I need to meet Pete. Does that make sense? A direct experience is always best. This will take you many places in life, not just self-knowledge, but in life, yeah? It's applicable. Pratyakshanumanangamapramananim <laughs> That's the eighth sutra. He's describing wrong knowledge. So what is wrong knowledge? Wrong knowledge or misunderstanding is mythical understanding. So the word mitya, mitya, Sanskrit, mitya, mitya, M-I-T-H-Y-A, eighth sutra, mitya. Mitya is myth. Myth, myth is a lie. Myth is not true, right? So mitya, so it's untrue understanding. We, we, we use the, the, the uh, example of the rope and the snake. You walk through a field at night, you see a, a, a snake, you jump back, you realize it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rope, right? The truth is it's a rope, but your perception was that it was a snake, which caused you pain, right? <clears throat> Let me stop and talk about pain for a moment. Pain doesn't have to be gross. Pain can be very subtle. When you, when, when you are disturbed in any way, that's considered pain. Any kind of disturbance. Think about this. When you're at peace, you're at total peace. Any little thing that, that excites you is a disturbance. That is pain. Make sense? No, not necessarily. Um, pain is specifically described as dukkha, which we don't get to the second chapter, but I'll tell you now. Dukkha. Dukkha means disagreeable space. It's whenever your mind is in a disagreeable space. Ka means space. Akash. Akash means space. Du means disagreeable. But oftentimes it's translated as suffering or pain. But, ult but ultimately what it means is disagreeable mental space. We'll get to this when we get to the second chapter. I'll talk about, talk about it more. Okay. Okay. Um, so any kind, anytime where you're like disagreeing with something in any kind of way, like, I don't like that. That's pain. At a very gross level, you become, become reactive. But at a subtle level, we put up with it, right? But it's still pain. It makes you want to move away from it. But not, maybe not enough to, for you to take any action. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> 
Shabdagnya it's a ninth sutra. Shabdagnya nanupati vastu shunyo vikalpaha shabda. So so here he's talking about vikalpa. What is vikalpa? Vikalpa is imagination or fantasy. What is imagination or fantasy? It is based on a word alone. So if I say something, if I say cow, your head, you think of a cow, right? You visualize, you think, you know, there's no cow. It's just the word or the thought alone produces a creation in your mind that you perceive. It's called vikalpa. Um, and then uh, 10, abhava pratyaya lambana tamo vrittir nidra. Nidra means sleep. So abhava is a non-existence. It's a state in which you don't exist. I think we talked about the three states of awareness, wake state, sleep state, and dream state, right? You guys remember this? I'm going to talk about that, these three states again in, in chapter two. But uh, in a sleep, in sleep state, you don't have any cognition of me, my, I, me, my, or mine. In your dream state, you do. Like I had an experience in my dream. You can, I had this or I experienced this. Where in your dream, in your sleep state, you don't know who you are, when you are, or where you are, or what you are, and then all that is gone, right? Time and space is gone. Self, everything is gone. You're in a uh, stupor, stupor. So in my, in my book, the book that uh, you guys got, this one, he says, Abhava Prataya Lambana Tamo Vritir Nidra. In your other books, it doesn't say Tamo, it just says Vritir Nidra. So this, I'm pretty sure most of your books don't have the Tamo. But one of you guys asked me about, what is Tamas? Sarah, you asked me last week, what is Tamo Guna? What is Tamo? And I talked about the three Gunas. Yes? Did you guys, did you guys read the, the handouts about the Gunas? Did you guys read the handouts? I, I, I think I added three handouts about the Gunas. It's good to understand what the Gunas are. Does anybody need a refresher on that? Okay. Briefly, there are three Gunas. And this is also in the videos, but I will talk about it now. So you have um, the three gunas. The three gunas are like three children. How many guys have um, two siblings? Anybody have two siblings? Two siblings? Okay. So this will make sense to you. So you have what's called Thomas. Thomas is a quality of um, heaviness, heaviness, uh, darkness. Um, so at a physical level, it's heaviness. It's uh, 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 inability to, to move. It's like being stuck in mud or something, right? Or quicksand. It's like just really, oh, uh, just lethargic, right? At a mental level, it's like um, confusion, ignorance. Um, a modern term would be brain fog. You guys heard this ba brain fog? You wake up in your brain fog because you drank too much the night before. You have a little bit of brain fog. Takes a while before the fog go away. Okay, that's Thomas. So we'll call this Thomas. Thomas tends to be overweight. He puts on a lot of weight and he gets really lazy and lethargic. And you have to explain things several times for Thomas to get it because he's a little slow mentally. You understand? Um, but Thomas, though, no, that's Ayurveda. I'm sorry. Anyways, Thomas, though, when he gets up and going, he has a lot of energy. It's like like a, like an elephant. But it's hard, you know. Elephants, it's, it's, it takes a lot of energy to get going. But once they get going, they they can do a lot. It's just hard to get them off the couch. Right? Okay. That's that's Thomas. Uh, now the second, the next one is Rajas, and we'll call it, and it's black, and I wrote this on, in black on purpose. The next one is called Rajas, R-J-A-S, R-A-J-A-S, Rajas. Rajas is, um, Rajas quality at the mental level um, is uh, uh, activity, lots of activity. The mind's going here and there and here and there, um, bouncing around. It's just a lot of energy, passion, um, and uh, to a fault, it becomes um, 
attachment and jealousy and anger. You know, it's like fiery. It's the color is red. <clears throat> at a physical level, he just can't sit down. He just wants to move. You know, at the beginning of yoga class, usually, asana class, people are like real fidgety. They're sitting there and they're like, oh, can't wait. Shut up. You know, can't wait to start. You know, that, that, that's rajas. What happens at the end of yoga class? Are they the same? No, that rajas energy has gone. That is gone. So what happens is you're able to sit still. So the next, the next, uh, the next um, quality, I'm going to write in blue, but it's really white. It's called sattva. 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 It's supposed to be white, by the way. White, not blue. But um, white on white, you won't be able to see it. But sattva, sat means true, truth. And sattva, the qualities of sattva at the mental level is clarity, karo, clarity. To, 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 to uh, have clear understanding, um, love, compassion, um, wisdom. These are all sattvic qualities mentally. Um, and um, uh, at, a, at, a, at a, a physical level, it's um, lightness, agility. Um, for example, someone who, someone who um, is tamasic can't really get up. They like to sleep in. Typically, they're usually tired, and it's really hard. They're hitting snooze all the time. Again, if you drink a lot of fermented liquids like alcohol, you're going to feel tamasic in the morning. So think about that. How do you feel after having a lot of alcohol? Very tamasic. On the other hand, someone who's rajasic, they can't go to sleep. They're always waking up multiple times every night. The mind's constantly going. It's, it's hard to... Um, Concentrate on one thing because the mind's producing other th objects for you to like be aware of. Does that make sense? So rajas. <clears throat> so people who come to class are either rajasic, r tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic. Someone who comes to class who's sattvic, they'll sit down and they'll probably be very still and just take everything in with patience. They'll take everything in with patience, right? And understanding and compassion. And um, someone who's rajasic, which most people are because they're fighting traffic or whatever to get to yoga class. And then they're still in this rajasic state. Oh my God. And they're all, oh, hurry up and I just want to get going. Come on, you know, they, 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 they're antsy, anxious, anxiety. Or someone who shows up to class, they, they, uh, they're, they're sleepy. Usually people don't show up to Masik because they wouldn't have made it to class. They couldn't get up off their butt to get to class. So most of your students are going to be rajasic, most of them. Um, so, uh, Sleep is a tamasic state. You drink too much alcohol, you pass out. It puts you in a tamasic state. Tamas. And what is tamas? Tamas is like a veil. It's like a big tarp. Imagine if you had your, your, your light of awareness, which is like, say, the, the projector lamp is the light of awareness. It's like putting a big old tarp on top of that light. Now you're asleep. Then you uncover it, and then you wake up again. Make sense? This is called nidra, sleep. So, abhava pratyaya lambana tamo vrittir nidra. It's a state in which you're, you don't exist because something has covered your awareness. Okay? <clears throat> Eleven, anabhuta vashaya sampramosha sprithihi. Um, I know I'm going pretty fast. You guys good online? You guys good? Okay, eleventh sutra, memory, smritihi, smriti. Smriti means memory. Um, in India, there's a, a you know Gandhi, right? Mahatma Gandhi. Maha means great. Atma means soul. The great soul, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. There's a um, statue of Gandhi in in um, India and uh, several, and uh, under it, it says um, uh, uh, Gandhi Smriti, so remembering the memorial. So smriti also means memorial, to remember, remembering Gandhi. So smriti here means memory. What is memory? <clears throat> memory is an object or an experience that, has, uh, that you can recall. It's real simple. It's being able to recall something. There's a, there's a, um, <clears throat> a, a theory that, that uh, in the yoga tradition uh, that uh, says that no experience is ever lost. No experience is ever lost. Um, 
and uh, it, it can always be recalled at some somehow. It's like you know you, you can't you meet a person or you re meet a person but you can't remember their name, but then you remember their name later. It wasn't lost. It was just you were unable to recall it, right? So if you can recall it, it's a memory. Here's the thing. The more times you recall a memory, the more likely it's going to change. The more times you recall a memory, over time, the more likely it's going to change. <clears throat> they, they took couples, you know, people that have been married for decades, and they would ask them questions about when they first met. Two different stories. So what's real? What is real in this life? <laughs> don't trust your senses. Don't trust your memory. And don't trust your own perception. So what is real? We'll get there. We'll get there. <clears throat> if anything, we need to be, we, this, this studying this should make us humble, right? And, and not always think we're right. Like, you can trust your senses because it, they could fool you, right? Look at any magician, right? And don't trust your memory because it can fool you. But just be open-minded that, you know, there, there's a possibility that I could be wrong, right? <clears throat> All right, so that was the, what, 11th Sutra? Oh, sorry. Okay, that was the 11th Sutra. So now we're on 12. So I think this is where we stopped last week, yes? Any comments or questions up to this point? I think next time, I'm going to set you guys up here, and I'm going to sit over there so I can see everybody in one. It makes more sense. It makes more sense. <laughs> Okay, you guys online, you're good, right? All right, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so let's move on to the next section. That was, that was, that's the, consider the first two sections of the sutras. The first section ends at four. And then the next section explains what are the five vrittis, chitta vrittis. And then now we begin the next, the third section in the first chapter, or the first book. He says, Abhyasa Varyagya Biyam Tanniroda, Abhyasa. So this is a very important sutra, very important sutra. He gives you two things to think about, Abhyasa and Varyagya. Abhyasa, Abhyasa, Abhyasa means, Abhyasa means, okay, okay. let me back up, because the next sutra tells you what Abhyasa means. Let me back up. Ab here he says, Abhyasa, which is Abhyasa, these two things, Abhyasa and Varyagya, are needed in order to get Niroda. Abhyasa, Varyagya, Bhyam, Tan, then Niroda. In other words, in order for you to get Niroda, you need Abhyasa and Varyagya. Very simple. So then the question that arises is, what the heck is Abhyasa? Well, Abhyasa is, according to the Sutra 13, he says that practice that is repeated, 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 constant attempt to stay with an object. Abhyasa, the effort. Yatna means effort. Yatna means effort. And stitao is like stiti, like sama stitihi, to be still and steady. To be. This is a very important word, stitao, stitao, stitihi. Most people can't stay. People have very little staying power. I mean, look at everyone's resolutions. There's, I mean, what are we at? The 25th, what is it? The 25th? I would say a majority of people already stop focusing on their resolutions. People that don't have staying power. You got to stay. Think about this. Meditate on this. What is, your, what is your capacity to stay with something? Your commitments, your intentions. Like in your yoga asana practice, you've set an intention at the beginning of class. 30 minutes in, you, what intention? Can you stay with your intention for at least an hour or two hours? 
So you, it becomes your discipline. Yoga is discipline. Well, this yoga is discipline. There are other yogas that are not discipline. It's just, just a way of being, but that's another, another talk. So this is, the first, this is the first chapter, which is the most advanced teachings. So here it's so simple. Just stay with something for a long time. So what is he talking about here up to this point? He hasn't mentioned any asanas. There's no postures yet. He hasn't mentioned breathing. So what is he talking about? Meditation. He's talking about meditation here. This whole chapter is on meditation. But he does mention the breath later. We'll, we'll get to that after we get to 30. But, um, but yeah, he's saying, so a lot of people will, will um, translate this as asana practice. I, I see it all the time online. Oh, yeah, abhyasa means showing up on the mat. Not quite. We can, it's still beneficial to understand it that way, but Patanjali specifically mentioned that this is about meditation, samadhi in particular. Because he's talking to the natural born yogi, someone who already has a capacity to enter samadhi. And then for those who can't enter samadhi, this is, it's sort of foreshadowing or telling you where it's going and where it could go, and what, are, what the goals are as a practitioner. So it's to, to permanently stay with an object. So I wrote down, this is what Ramaswamy said. So stittal means to permanently stay, permanently stay with an object. You can add permanently there. It's the, it's the effort or the willpower Yatna, you can also, yatna can also, um, it's a synonym to the word sankalpa. Sankalpa means, sankalpa means intention. Sankalpa means intention. Sankalpa means intention. It also means determination. Sankalpa means willful determination. So when I make an intention, I am putting everything into it. You don't just make, you know, set intentions lightly. Oh, you know, today I'll set this intention, tomorrow I'll set that intention. It's like when I set an intention, I am willfully determined to make it happen. It is a vow and a promise. It is a commitment and it is a discipline. So yatna here just means effort or willpower. To stay with an object permanently. Re practice, abhyasa is a repeated at attempt, constant attempt, constant, constant, steady, all the time, without break. Okay, 14. It's a long one. Hope I don't butcher this. Satu dirga kala nairantarya satkara 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 Sevito. All right, so this is interesting. Um, here he says, in, in my book, he says, Satkara Dara Sevito. And then in other books, they don't have the Dara part. I, call, I asked my teacher, I was like, so what, what, why is there no Dara? And is it, does it, he was like, it doesn't really matter. It means the same thing. So um, Satkara Dara Sevito Drudabhumihi. Do yoga full-time, not part-time. What is this? Okay, so this is, Practice done for a long time without interruption. He's again describing what is this abhyasa. Practice done for a long time without interruption. Not like, you know, doing it, you know, two or three days a week and then skipping five days a week. That's not abhyasa. Abhyasa means all day, every day. I used to have a shirt. You ever see me wear that shirt? All day, every day? <laughs> all day, every day. I have a shirt. Anyways. Um, all day, every day. It is full-time yoga from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, and then you dream about yoga. That's abhyasa, long and uninterrupted over a long period of time. It's full-time yoga. Practice done over a long period without interruption becomes firmly established. That's how you, that's how you make a habit out of something. Okay? Lifetime and full-time yoga. That's what that's all about. 
Okay, any questions on that? It's a tall order, isn't it? It's, a, it's hard. You got to commit your life to it. Uh, 15th, the 15th sutra. So here he talks about the next word, which is vairagya. Vairagya. So, um, drishta, drishta means, what is drishta? All right, earlier we talked about drashtu, right? In the third sutra, third, tara drashtu. Drashtu means one who has drish, one who sees, the observer. Drishta means that which is seen. So it means the object. It means the object. Drishta means the object. All that is being, all that is being experienced or that which is, uh, um, I'm sorry, that's, Okay, I messed up. It is, it is, um, drishta is all that is experienced. Yeah, it is, it is the object. It is the experience, that which can be seen or experienced. Anu, again, means um, following. Anush, Anush, Ravika, okay, here means, um, It's referring to otherworldly things, not the mundane, but um, things in the realm of religion. Things in the realm of religion. Vishaya, Vishaya refers to objects. Uh, the Trishna, Trishna means thirst. So here he's saying, so thirst or hunger for objects. And Vashikara, the senses are drawing, not pulling out. Um, samya, Samya, Sam means total. Gnya means understanding, like not awareness. Jnana, Jnana, this is Gnya, means an understanding. And Varyagya means dispassion. So the word Varyagya means dispassion. Varyagya means dispassion. And he's giving you four things to become dispassionate about. Is that right? Is that proper grammar? About which to become dispassionate. Whatever. Um, so he's saying that you need to he, become dispassionate. St stop being so passionate about things, objects outside of you. Stop having thirst and hunger for all these objects. Let your senses draw inward, not outward. And then finally, and I'm doing not the order that they mention here, but finally, even the promises of religion. Even the promises of religion. He's telling you, become dispassionate. If you want to reach the highest state of yoga, you got to let go of all the promises of religion. Which is really interesting, huh? People say, well, you, well this yoga is this, uh, another religion and I can't practice this because it's against my religion. But he's saying all religions. Because that can become an obstacle in your realization of self. He's trying to remove all the obstacles so you can go straight to the source. Make sense? Because religions are sort of like the middleman, sort of the, the medium in between you and the divine. That's how it is in India. You got to go through the Brahmins to reach God. They come over, they do ceremonies and blessings because you, you can't do it yourself, you know. There's no way to do it yourself. And there are other religions that do that too, isn't it? Right? Got to go through a middleman. The yogi is like, I don't I want to bypass the middleman. Show me a direct path. I want a direct path and I want to experience it myself. That's why yogis were outcasts a lot of times. Yogis are known as outcasts and um, extremists because they have to, these are extreme practices. Um, all right. So dispassion for all feelings, the worldly senses, as well as religious and other worldly experiences. It is without thirst for objects. It is, it is when the senses are drawn in and not pulling you out. Our senses are always pulling us. We want to see pretty things. We want to hear pretty uh, nice sounds. Right? We want to taste good things and smell good things. I remember before, before um, I, I found yoga, I was all about the colognes. I mean, I had so many colognes. And they were like, and now I have four bottles. That's excessive, right? But, but I, I used to have so many, and they were like hardly used because it's so much. 
and always got to have music. I was a DJ. It was always about the music. What else? Clothes. I oh, so much, so many clothes. I still have a lot of clothes. But um, um, but I get, but I got at some point when I was do, deep in my practice, I started naturally without even studying this stuff. I started wanting less. I was in my, I would be in my car, and I would just be in silence. No music and totally at peace. As a matter of fact, the radio and music disturbed my mind. I felt like it's disturbing my peace. <clears throat> yeah, and, and um as he, and as I started purifying my my senses, my taste buds, like I wouldn't need a lot of seasoning in my food. I didn't need it because it was too much. I don't know if you about you, but I was a speed addict at one point and um <clears throat> we would go days without eating and so at that point your your taste buds get really heightened and so anything i put in my mouth was like boom and i remember like after you know two or three days not eating um i had a i put a pringle you know the pringles they look like little bills like and they fit on your tongue just perfectly where every single taste bud gets hit and i would put it in i'm like oh it was like crazy that's what my taste buds were like because as I purified my senses, it just took just a little bit to, to, to experience something. But if we're constantly clogging our senses, clogging our senses, it takes much more for us to feel. That's what this whole practice is about purification. Purify your body, purify your senses, purify your mind so that you can experience truth, undistorted truth. Yeah? <clears throat> And I'm not advocating speed, by the way. <laughs> but I do advocate fasting. And that's what I actually did. What I did. But I do advocate fasting. Okay. Um, right. So let's see here. Let, let's see some of my notes. <clears throat> so, these, uh, so this was the four kinds of dispassion. The four kinds of dispassion. Is this suture 15? Um, <clears throat> Uh, so a lot of notes here. Va ver um, here, write this down. Note that this sutra is known as the lower type of dispassion. The lower type. The lower type of dispassion. The dispassion of objects and um, experiences and religion okay? and senses. These are lower, lower type of dispassion. Um, there's talk about in, within the Vedas, um, within you know the body of knowledge, that there are seven levels of happiness. This is interesting. Seven levels of happiness. These different levels are heavens different levels of heavens, all right? This is, the world we live in is a level as well, a level of heaven, this level. Because there's another level, there are levels below us, three levels below us, three levels above us. Understand? Three heavens above us, three levels of heavens below us. And if you do good karma, you, you're a good person in this whatever level that you live in, whichever reality you live in, you get to graduate to the next level in which more happiness can be attained. So it makes one ought to do good in this life so they can graduate to the next level. It's just a theory, right? And so these religions promise another level of happiness if we do good in this level, yeah? Each heaven gives us a hundred times more happiness than we could ever acquire in this lifetime in this level. Each level gives you a hundred times more happiness. Make sense? But realizing your true nature exceeds all the levels of happiness you can attain in any of these seven levels. So realizing your true nature exceeds all the happiness you can attain in any level, in any heaven. It's the ultimate transcendence. <clears throat> mm. 
Okay. Yeah, this is known as the inferior. Infer in this level, the, this, these, this sutra is the inferior vairagya, the lower, apara, apara. Apara is known as apara vairagya, apara, apara. Para means supreme. Apara means not supreme. This is not supreme. So the next sutra he talks about, what is the supreme? 16th sutra. Tat param, tat that para, para means supreme. Tat para purusha, Kyate guna vaitrishnam. So here he's saying that um, the highest dispassion, when the mind knows the sub most subtle principle, the self, it automatically develops a dispassion towards the 24 principles. This type of understanding is superior. This is superior type of aryagya. So uh, superior, superior to contemplating on understanding the 24 principles. So this sutra is specifically on Sankhya philosophy. Remember I mentioned the Sankhya earlier, 24 principles. Um, do I need to go over that again? I, I went over it extensively in the, in the lecture. In the, you guys, are you guys good with this, Sankhya? Okay. Yeah? Yeah? Um, so, I think this is important. I'm going to go over it again. Briefly. Briefly. So, Sankhya, so you'll see it spelled S A M K H Y A or with an N. Sankhya or Samkhya. This is correct. Correct is Samkhya. Sam means total. Um, Kya means like um, it's, it comes from a word that means like um, exposition or uh, like a body of knowledge. And so those who study philosophy, if, they, if you study all the different philosophies and then you get to Sankhya and you study Sankhya and you go, ooh, this is complete. This is actually a complete philosophy. Sankhya means complete philosophy. As a matter of fact, a lot of the Buddhism, you see Buddhism, yoga, other things, they, they come from this. They take, they take from Sankhya. But in order to understand Sankhya, you got to develop yoga, the power to concentrate. Otherwise, it's over your head, you know? So, so the basis, uh, so uh, Sankhya says that there, is, uh, there are two parts of reality. There are two parts. One is called Purusha. And the other one's called Prakriti. So Purusha, Purusha means um, pure consciousness. So the qualities are pure. Pure consciousness. Which means it doesn't change. Qualities are unchanging. Um, can anyone help me out? Give me some words. What is What are other qualities of Purusha. I'll give you the answer. Awareness. Aware. To be, it is awareness. It's pure consciousness. It's unchanging. It's um, eternal. So eternal means never born, never dies. Never born, never dies. Um, in destructible indestructible you can't destroy it in the bhagavad gita in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about this and he, t he says you can't wet it you can't burn it and you can't destroy it you can't damage it yeah so this is purusha this is spirit this is soul purusha Spirit, soul, hmm? it's formless, weightless, nameless,
As a matter of fact, all the negative words, negative not meaning like positive, negative, negative, negative meaning less, form less, name less, gender less. genderless, all the negative um, attributes without, you know, attributes that are without. It's interesting because in most major religions, God is described in these ways, nameless, formless. Yeah. <clears throat> and then on the other side, you got prokriti. Prokriti Prakriti is an interesting word. They're all interesting words. You've got um, pra. Pra, it comes from the word prakash, which means light. And pra refers to sattva. Because sattva is light. Kru. Kru. Is, a, is the word, the root word, kru. Kru means doing, doing. It is the root word of karma, kriya, krama, kirtan. It means doing. So it refers to rajas. Rajas is doing. T refers to tamas. T refers, so prakriti are the three gunas. So you, let me go back to the three gunas. The three gunas are like three children, three siblings. One is dominant, usually dominant. Of, the, of, of you students who have siblings, there are three of you. There's always, there's not always, but there's usually one who's in charge of the other two, right? The other two follow the one. Is that true in your sibling rivalry? But there are days when the, the leader, the dominant one, steps down and one of the other two step up. Isn't it true? Does that ever happen? Yes. The gunas behave the same way. They, in, in their manifest form. For example, someone who is dominated by sattva, sattvic Sarah. Sarah has a lot of patience and compassion. And she's very understanding. She's got a very sharp mind. You say something once and Sarah understands it. You don't need to repeat yourself. And she's, she'll go. And she listens very nice, very clearly. Sattvic Sarah. But then there's Rajasic Roger. He's running around the dinner table. Everyone sat down, ready to eat. And Roger's under the table, running around. Right? Roger! Ah! And then Tomasic, Thomas might be in the other room playing video games. Maybe. I'm just giving an example. You got Thomas, Sat, uh, Sarah, and Roger, the three siblings. Maybe, maybe Roger is the dominant one. So someone who is rajasic tends to show rajasic tendencies. But there are days when, when rajasic Roger can be tamasic. But it's not usual. But there are days when Roger is tamasic. He doesn't get things. His mind is dull. Maybe he had lack of sleep. Maybe he had some, some Thomas from the external world. Maybe, maybe he was reading sad, you know, sad uh, novel or something. And listening to sad music and drinking lots of alcohol. Um, but they take turns. But there's usually one dominant guna within each of us. Yes? And objects as well. Objects in the universe are either, ten, they tend to be rajasic or sattvic or tamasic. <clears throat> so prakriti is the unmanifest and manifest universe over here on the right side of this table. On the left side, you've got Purusha or consciousness. Left side is consciousness. On the right side, you've got Prakriti. Existence is when these two merge. You are here because Purusha is living within Prakriti in your body. Your body is Prakriti. It's the manifest universe. Your thoughts are also Prakriti. Your thoughts are not Purusha. So the 24 principles that they talk about here in, in Sutra 16, that they don't really mention, but they're mentioning, are the 24 principles over here. 
24 principles. The Purusha is the 25th principle. So, un, so once, you, once you have an understanding of what is Purusha, once you understand it intellectually and have a direct experience, you will start, you know, you'll have little fleeting moments of these experiences. He's saying that you will slowly start to develop this passion towards all of this prakriti. And that's what happened to me for a period of time. Make sense? So if you continue this yoga journey, you're going to probably change. Your priorities will change. Make sense? Because these things won't drive you as much anymore. Your interest in these things decrease. You become more interested in, in attaining this, purusha, spirit, self-knowledge, self-realization. Because you find that the, the happiness that you get from this far exceed the happiness that you get from anything else. Tatparam, this is the higher dispassion. Para varyagya. Para var the highest dispassion is dispassion towards the material and the energetic and the mental world. Oh, can I stop you for a sec? What was the root word for T? Tamas. Okay. Yes. T refers to Tamas. Because we got light doing. Pra was light, Crate was doing, and T is just Thomas? Right. I don't know the root word, but it ref T refers to Thomas. Thank you. You're welcome. So, <clears throat> so we talk about Sankhya, Yoga. Yoga is a philosophy. Sankhya is a philosophy. Vedanta is a philosophy. All these philosophies say that um, don't rely on the outside world for your happiness. They all say the same thing. Don't rely on the outside world for your happiness. You get less and less happiness from the outside world as you get older. That's the premise. And you can't really tell young people this. They don't understand it yet. And that all of these things, the yoga, sankhya, and Vedanta, they all say the same thing, that knowledge of the self is superior to anything else. Knowledge of the self is superior to anything else. And it's important to understand that, that the self, oh yeah, that's another word I didn't write down, self, with a capital S. That's another self. Whoa, it's a really bad handwriting, sorry. Self. Purusha is self with a capital S. And so you have to understand that Purusha and the self are unaffected by the gunas. It, it's, it's unaffected by the prakriti. You really have to understand this moving forward. Purusha is unaffected by prakriti. They use the example um, oil and water oil and water. They never mix. Well, actually they figured out scientifically how to mix it with pressure and all that. But, but, but you mix oil and water into, a, um, into a, a container, you stir it up, shake it up, and you wait a while, what happens? It separates, yeah? It separates, right? Like, look at your balsamic vinaigrette. It separates. You shake it up, you, but, but it separates. So, likewise, the, the, the Purusha and Prakriti they never mix. They, they just coexist in a, in a shared space. That is your body. Okay? Okay. Let's move on. So then, um, this is the next section. This is another section. What time is it? Oh, we got to close up soon. Do you have time to go to the next, through the next section? Yes. We do. Okay. So this next section talks about four levels of samadhi. Four levels of samadhi. Four levels of samadhi. Sampragnata, sampragnata, 
Sampragnata. Sampragnata is the, the name of this particular level, but he uses, he puts that word at the end. Vitarka, Vitarka, what is Vitarka? So Vitarka is, um, mm, a gross object that can be understood without an argument, right? So um, the example that uh, that he uses is like um, I, I'm sitting in a chair, right? It's we're gonna it's gonna be pretty stupid to argue that this is a chair. So having having samadhi on a gross object is one level of samadhi. This goes back to what Peter asked earlier. And then vichara is the, the samadhi on something that is subtle, like formula, like a, theor like a theory, or like a mathematical formula, or like a, um, an idea. Some, some, yeah, mantra is subtle. Mm -hmm. If it has to do with the mind, manas, intellectual, then... The third one is the, the meditation on this feeling of bliss, ananda, this, I, this feeling. So even more subtle, right? Even more subtle than, this, than ideas. It's like a feeling, okay? Then finally, um, asmita. Asmita is, is, is a, asmita means Asmi means I am. Asmi. Asmi means I am. Asmita means a feeling that I am. Like your ego. The sense of I-ness. Asmita. The sense of I. The feeling of I am. Very subtle, isn't it? It's even more subtle than bliss. Because it goes beyond feeling. It's a sense of I exist. Is samadhi different than Naroda? Samadhi is of two types. Samadhi is both a state and a skill. Naroda means to stop. So, to answer your so Naroda refers to the activities. Samadhi means total concentration or the ability to concentrate without interruption. Um, so are they the same thing? I mean, yes and no. They're... So, yeah, neurotas are like um, a description. Samadhi is a state and a skill but they're similar. You can't perform Naroda like you can perform Samadhi, right? Naroda describes what is happening within the mind, no activities. Whereas Samadhi can be an activity if you're applying it as a skill. But then you reach a state of Samadhi through the application of Samadhi. Yeah? Okay. Most of the times when you talk to you know our modern yoga people, they 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 will talk they will use samadhi as a state. They will use it as a state, samadhi. Oh, is it he's in samadhi or she's in samadhi? Or she's attained samadhi. But they very rarely use it as a skill. Samadhi is also the, the some, when samadhi is used as a skill, it's the, the uh, Patanjali uses the word samyama, which he doesn't mention until later. Samyama means total control. Sam means total. Yama means control. Total control. And they're synonymous. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, right. So yeah. So there are these four, these four things that you can perform samadhi on. So yogi is able to hold onto, onto this, an object that is gross or subtle, train his or her mind to be with it. A yogi can also hold it and understand it completely. He or she knows and develops this passion towards it. Contemplation in samadhi until he or she understands it. This passion comes from it. 
it is not created. So in other words, it is a result. Dispassion comes as a result of practice. So here, samadhis can become more subtle, gross, intellectual, bliss, and then beyond bliss. I'm looking at, at this right here, by the way, yeah, our book. Um, Sampragnana Samadhi, contemplation with an object. So this is the, we'll call this lower types of samadhi, because there's still an object. You're contemplating on an object. Are you all with me? Sampragnana Samadhi. Just remember that. There's an object involved. Number 18, um, okay, 15 minutes. Um, this is, um, Here he's mentioning um, asam pragnata, asam pragnata. So the previous one is sam pragnata. This is asam pragnata. So in other words, this is meditation without an object. This is a higher level form of samadhi. Eighteen. Asam pragnata. The previous one is sam pragnata. Total concentration with an object. This is asam pragnata. This is total contemplation or meditation without an object. So what happens is, um, you know, referring to the previous, the for, uh, anya, anyaha, referring to the previous sutra, virama. Virama means no more. I'm done. It's when the mind has had enough. When the mind has had enough, it says, I'm done. I'm done with it. So this mental mold, pratyaya, abhyasa through practice, purva, refer, previously practiced, you create a new samskara, samskara. The samskara, the, he says samskara, the, uh, what is the samskara? Samskara means, um, samskara means uh, uh, patterns, tendencies, or impressions. Samskara means patterns, tendencies, or impressions, uh, or habits. Samskara also means habits. So um, you create a new habit, the habit of, I've had enough. I'm satisfied. You know, at the end of a meal, a good meal, I've had enough. I don't need any more. When you reach that state, your mind enters a state of meditation without an object. An object is no longer required. Asam pragnana samadhi. Make sense? I'm satisfied. I don't need any more. So this is a higher level. This samadhi yogi is, um, at this point, has no interest in prakriti. No more in interest. This type of yogi is known as a raja yogi. What is raja yoga? Raja yogi. Raja yogi. Um, so Raja means king or royal, royal uh, or highest. A Raja yogi. A Raja yogi is a meditating yogi. So you have four types of yogas, the classical yogas, four types. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to digress here a little bit here. Sorry, you guys. There you go. So Raja means king or royal, it means highest. Raja yoga is the highest yoga. This is a book on Raja yoga. There are four types of yoga. There are more than four types of yoga, but in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, there, there are uh, classical yogas. And um, what's mentioned there is um, Raja yoga. So four classical, classical yogas. One is Raja Yoga, the highest yoga is yoga of the mind. Raja Yoga means yoga of the mind, mental yoga, concentration, 
contemplation, meditation, okay, is Raja Yoga. Then you have um, the type of yoga that is called Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the yoga of emotion or devotion. It is the yoga of the heart. It is a yoga of feeling. Bhakti yogis are just, they're just devoted to things. They're just so devoted. They, they, you know, they're, they're devotees of a particular lineage or Swami or whatever type, you know, like Hare Krishnas. Hare Krishnas are, are devotees of Krishna. Christians are devotees of a Jew. It's the truth. <laughs> Greatest Jewish yogi of all, Jesus the Christ. So these are bhaktis. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says, Love thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind. Bhakti yoga. They mention bhakti yoga and raja yoga in the Bible. Love thy God with all thy heart. Bhakti and all thy mind, raja. And, um, and then the other ones, three. Three is karma yoga. Karma yoga. Karma yoga is a yoga of action, the yoga of service. It's doing something and not expecting a return. Return on investment is not part of Raha Karma yoga. You just invest. You invest your efforts and your time. You do something and not having it. So it's do your best and leave the rest. You've heard of this term? Do your best and leave the rest. That's karma yoga. Like how many times have you gone, like, I can, I can recall times in my life where I've helped someone else out without expecting anything in return, right? But the beautiful thing about that is you get ten back, tenfold back. But you don't expect it, because if you expect it, mm, we'll see, right? Karma yoga. And four is... Gyan yoga. You've seen this word? Jnana. Gyan means, it means awareness, right? But here it means the yoga of wisdom. Jnana yoga means yoga of wisdom. So what we're doing now is Jnana yoga. We're studying Jnana yoga, the yoga of wisdom. And this Jnana yoga is teaching you Raja yoga. It's really interesting because the, the the yogis in the east, the yogis, they don't sort of they don't separate these things. It's all one. They all they pra the yogis practice all of this. You don't have someone just just practicing Raja Yoga. You don't have someone just practicing Karma Yoga. It's in the West we do that. We have our lives and then we go and we serve, right? Or we practice or we study on top of our lives, where these yogis are full-time. This is their life. This is their life. This is all they do. And they said that ultimately, the high, the ultimately what, they, what they end up doing is everything is done in devotion, bhakti yoga. Their, their studies is done in devotion. Their service is done in devotion. Their asanas, their postures is done in devotion. Dharma Mitra, one of my teachers, he says that make your practice an offering to God. So when you're on your mat practicing, it's not, you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the highest good. It's a different attitude. Whereas here, it's more of a workout. I was in the gym earlier today, and they're like, yeah, I like to practice Ashtanga with the, with the heat on because I get a better workout. Do you get a better workout because the heat is on? I'm, I'm not. Anyways. And plus, Ashtanga is it's not a workout. It's a work in. But that's, it's a gym environment, whatever. That's fine, right? Keep my mouth quiet. Um, let me let you ask so that I can hear. <laughs> so my question was, do you, would you categorize that we move through these different types of yoga in the Western world today? Um, would, do we move through these different types of yoga in the Western world today? Yes, I, I think because of just the nature of our civilization, society, and, and, and lifestyle, um, 
it, it is it is compartmentalized. Um, I don't think they are, but I think that they are practiced in that way, and I think it's good to learn them that way. Then once you learn all the different things about, and then you end up integrating all aspects into your life, like like even in teacher trainings, they have like um they, they teach you asanas, which is so sorry. Hatha yoga is part of this Raja yoga. Hatha yoga is part of Raja yoga. I think I've mentioned that previously. The Hatha yoga, where Hatha yoga ends, Raja yoga begins. So yeah, we're in hot in teacher trainings. We're doing Hatha yoga, but oftentimes in teacher trainings, we have moments where we teach karma yoga. So and then we talk about bhakti yoga, love and stuff like that too. So we we talk we integrate them. I think we integrate them, but I think a lot of times we because the, the Western mind is so compartmentalized that we like to identify with one thing or the other. I think I told the story about, I was on a plane trip one time and there's a Belgium guy. And did I tell you that story? The Belgium guy was like, like he saw I had beads on or something. And uh, he goes like, what do you, you know, he goes, do you practice yoga? I was like, yeah, I practice yoga. He goes, I practice yoga. I practice Ashtanga yoga. And I'm like, well, I do, I practice Ashtanga yoga too. And, um, you know, and I, started, I assumed that he was talking about the asanas. And then he goes, he goes, oh, no, I just do meditation. I don't do asanas. So, again, even there he's compartmentalizing. Oh, I'm, I'm with this school, and I'm with this gang. I'm with this clique, and you're with that clique. It's just how the Western mind seems to work. We don't see this in Japanese culture where everything is one. You know, it is like in Jap Anyways, I'm going on a tangent. Um, it's a cultural thing, I think. We have five minutes. Uh, thank you. So, um, right. I think I can do it. Okay. So, 19, can we move on? Okay. Let me go back to 18. Sorry. So, on 18, as a Raja Yogi, your mind is so powerful and so focused that you contemplate on the 24 tattvas, the 24 tattvas referring to um, Prakriti. And you do what's called neti neti. This is not mentioned in the book, but it's called neti neti. Neti neti means not this, not that. You heard this practice? Not this, not that. It's a process of elimination. So you develop this, this contemplation, this power to samadhi. And then you contemplate on the 24 tattvas and you, go, and you reject them. Reject them meaning I am not that. 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 And you go through the whole list. And you realize you are none of the things that are on this property side. Once you realize that you are nothing on the property side, there's only one thing left that you can be, which is Purusha or spirit. And in that moment, boom, enlightenment happens. You had a direct experience with self, intellectually and through awareness, through mind and through awareness. Make sense? So on 19, 19 says, the uh, 19 says, uh, talks about this inferior samadhi, this type. So they see uh, those who are not ready for the complete ending of samsara. You hear this all the time. Why, why would I want to do that? I want to live. I want to have experience. I want to experience all the, the joys of life. I'm like, well, the yogi would say, in order for you to understand the joys, you got to also understand the, the, the negative, right? In order for you to understand love, you got to understand pain. Right? You can't really understand one without the other, the dualities of life. So those who are not ready to, con to completely end the samsara, the, the, the samsara means end the cycle of birth and death, continues in different forms of birth after birth and want to be greater still, ego, and to live long. The ego wants to live forever. I don't ever want to die. Have no pain and still exist as an I, as mita, this I-ness feeling. They become celestial beings. So you can be a yogi and reach samadhi and then live as an angel, spirit, celestial being, right? Not in a human form, but in a different form that is unseen. You can continue to exist because your existence does not end. It's just your form changes. So here he's saying that you can exist as a celestial being, as an angel, um, or something like that, and have out-of-body experiences, um, and uh, or will merge into the subtle aspects of prakriti, not the sub, not the gross aspects, the subtle unseen aspects, um, because there's this idea that I want to be forever. There's still a sort of delusion or misunderstanding. It makes sense. Um, not necessarily in this body, but beyond the body. 
So this he, saw, he calls this an inferior yogi. Still a yogi, but inferior. Make sense? There's still a I want. I want. A superior yogi has no more wants. The desire is gone. Here, this yogi still wants, so therefore he still exists in form. It's a celestial form versus human form, okay? Remember, there's seven levels. It reminds me of that, is it, is it Lord of the Rings, where there's Middle Earth and... That's what I've... Is it Lord of the Rings? Never mind. Okay, I only have a few minutes left. So, okay, so... Um, I think that ends it. No, no, this next... Let's end it there. Let's end it here on, on, on 19. So here he's talking about inferior yogis, inferior samadhis. And then he's going to go and talk about other things moving forward. All right. If you have any questions, you guys, uh, please write them down and ask them on the next lecture. Please, 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 I beg you. I'm begging. I beg you to listen to those lectures so that we have them to something to talk about. Okay, like your questions. And then do some, do some practices. Try to sit with yourself for a while and then see what comes up and then ask me based on what you experience. This is going to get you there much faster if we do it this way, okay? All right. Om. Yogena Chittasya. Yogena Chittasya. Padena Vacham. Padena Vacham. Malam Shari Rasya Cha. Malam Shari Rasya Cha. Vaidya Kena. Vaidya Kena. Yopa Karotam. Yopa Karotam. Pravaram Muninam. Pravaram Muninam. Patanjalim. Patanjalim. Pranjali. Pranjali. Rana tos me. Rana tos me. Abahu. Abahu. Purusha Karam. Purusha Karam. Shanka Chakrasi. Shanka Chakrasi. Dharinam. Dharinam. Sahasra Shirasham. Sahasra Shirasham. Shvetam. Shvetam. Pranamami. Pranamami Patanjalim, Patanjalim, Srimate, Srimate, Anantaya, Anantaya, Nagarajaya, Nagarajaya, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, O. Thank you.